All right, guys, welcome to Oakwood. If you are new here, thank you for coming. We are so glad to see you here. And I'm excited you're all here, even on such a great day. I think spring is finally here, correct? I hope. What do you think? Hopefully for spring, but you never know. Join us today. It is not too late for our final OBC class. It's OBC 401, Effective Witnessing, that will help and teach you how to share your faith. Sounds real scary. This class makes it so much easier. Uh, just makes it easy to do. It's going to make you feel good about it, and it's something we're commanded to do. So if you'd still like to do that, you need to speak to Michael. There's a little bit of homework, but it won't take long. So we're going to be running that class today, and it's at 3 o'clock till 7.30. There is lunch break. We have pizza. A lot of time to get together to fellowship and learn about uh, spreading your word. So if you'd like to do that, talk to Michael today. Join us on Friday, October 4th at 6.30 at the Huntington Center in Toledo in a luxury suite for Together Again and Again tour featuring Mercy Me, Crowder, and the Cochran Company. Join, uh, sign up on the website or app. See Dan Milner. Dan, raise your hand. I think most of you know Dan, but I'm sure this sells out really quick, so you'll need to see him right away or sign up real quick because anytime there's a suite and you got bands like that, it's going to sell out really quickly. Guys, if you are still not in a Bible study or a small group, uh, we'd love to have you there. There's so many opportunities here. Check out our web or our app site or our app to see uh, the different, all the different groups we have. This is where you're going to share uh, and get to know people. My very best friends, the people I know the best in this church or have been in my life groups or my Bible studies. So it's a great way to share the Lord and learn the Lord and get to know somebody. So guys, if you haven't done that, check that out. Lots of different opportunities. Turn around, welcome someone to Oakwood, and let's get back to some awesome worship music. Love you guys.
love me the same You are amazing God Do you see the depths of my heart And you love me the same You are amazing God Do you see the depths of my heart And you love me the same Oh Lord For my deepest heart and life You know it's Jesus So you see the depths of my heart And you love me the same You are amazing God I just want to speak the name of Jesus Over every heart and every mind Cause I know there is peace within his presence Yeah, I speak Jesus and I just want to speak the name of Jesus Till every dark addiction starts to break Declaring there is hope and there is freedom I speak Jesus Your name is power Your name is healing in the streets Jesus in the darkness over every enemy and Jesus for my family I speak the holy name Jesus Whoa. Shout Jesus from the mountains and Jesus in the streets Jesus in the dark over every enemy And Jesus for my family I speak the holy name Jesus Cause your name is power Your name is healing Your name is life Break every stronghold 
And Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the darkness over every enemy, and Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name, Jesus. Shout Jesus from the mountains, and Jesus in the streets, Jesus in darkness over every enemy. Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name. Jesus, come on and shout, oh shout it. Shout Jesus from the mountains and Jesus in the streets. Jesus in the darkness over every enemy. In the morning when I rise In the morning when I rise Give me Jesus Give me Jesus Give me Jesus This world, just give me Jesus. Amen. Now, when I am alone, it's when I am alone. When I am alone, give me Jesus. Jesus, give me Jesus, you can help all this world, just give me Jesus. Now when I come to die, when I come to die When I come to die Give me Jesus Give me Jesus Give me Jesus world just give me Jesus oh. Father God we come before you today we bow our heads and we worship you we lifted our hands and worshiped you we lifted our voices our lives our hearts our walks where we are today, it's right here. It's all led us to right here, this moment before you, just to worship you. And in the midst of worshiping you, Lord, I feel that many of us found peace today. I feel that many of us who are struggling just have a, a moment to take a breath, because we're right here at your feet. We're worshiping you, even when it's hard, even when it's difficult, 
even when we don't want to. We're right here. You brought us to this building, to this church, to these people, to this pastor for a reason today. Soften our hearts. We're stubborn people. We are stubborn people in this life. Soften our hearts so that we can hear you speak. Word of God speak in this room today. Let the Holy Spirit fill every person in here. For those who are doubting, for those who don't believe, make them a believer today. You did not come here for nothing, church. There's a reason you are here, and yes, I'm talking to you. As our pastor comes to speak, anoint his words, and we are ready for your word today, Father. We pray this in your name. Bless our offering, our children, and our church. All God's children said... Amen. You may be seated. Hey, if you're joining with us online, guess what? We have a service every Saturday at 5 p.m. We have a service every Sunday morning at 11.15 a.m. It's like a little ad I do every week, and I've got it down. But I'm just saying, we'd love to get to know you. This is the time our ushers come forward. You can give at oakwoodchurch.org. You can give through the app. You can give right here in person. But God calls us to gather with his people in corporate worship to worship him and to hear his word spoken. And that's what we do right here. We'd love to get to know your name, get to know who you are as you grow with us right here in person. I ask our people in church every week. I ask our viewers online every week, and I love to get an answer out of it. Our God is good. Amen. This, uh, the message this morning literally becomes picking up where I left off last week in sitting down with dealing a thought process of every single one of you sitting in this room and how you're supposed to be growing as a Christian. Everyone in this room who, not name tag wise, but relationship wise, calls yourself a Christian, would you say amen? amen. Okay. Half of the growth issues amongst the majority of believers that I get around is a lack of an ability to say, I understand what my weaknesses are and I understand what my strengths are. We tend to live in our strengths. We tend to run away from our weaknesses. Half of that group is not being honest. They just won't sit down and say, this is who I am, this is what I'm going through. Most of that problem is, is because of an inability to stop, turn off the television set, get off of the line of nonsense that we're listening to regularly, and just go and be in a place where we're by ourselves to analyze who we are. Most of us live in a world of what is thrown at us, we just swallow and deal with. We never stop to analyze. I have been... Um, whether you want to call it fortunate or unfortunate, um, I am a 66-year-old individual who has been counseling adults since I was an 11-year-old child. That sounds weird to you, so you'll understand it. Hi, my name is Frank. My father's name is also Frank. My father was a pastor. So when I was an 11-year-old child, the phone would ring. I would pick it up. That's back when we had to go get the phone. You remember those days? Pick up the phone. Is this Frank? Little 11-year-old. Yes. And I would then spend 35 to 45 minutes counseling a full-grown adult, get off the phone after giving the advice, go to my dad's office, tell him what they said, tell him what I said, and we go back and forth in the discussion. I did that for years before some individuals finally figured out what was going on. They would say, is this the real Frank? I would say, yes. Here's what I've noticed in counseling. Hear this, you'll understand it. In the last 20 years, things have changed. How have they changed? I deal with more nutcases in life than I ever have before. I deal with more angry people. I deal with more people that are so screwed up in the head, it's not even funny. 44% of the United States of America documented, checked through medical groups and polling groups, 44% of the people that live in America are on antidepressant drugs. 44%. I'm sorry. That many people aren't depressed. What's wrong? 
two-thirds of our nation, two-thirds, 69 to 70% of our nation is overweight. One out of three adults are obese. When do we grow up and go, the food and drug group has just pfft us over and they've ripped everything out of our food. And what's happening to individuals like me that spend a lifetime counseling people, most individuals' bodies are not getting what they're supposed to get. Therefore, they're miserable in life, they're depressed in life, and they don't understand that the issue is it's what you're putting in your mouth. It's all politics. How many of you in this room drink milk? How many of you are milk drinkers? How many of you drink pasteurized milk? Do we have any raw milk drinkers in here? The politics over pasteurized milk and raw milk is absurd. I'm sorry, grew up down south. We drank it straight off the cow. Just fill the, th the mayonnaise jar. Remember that for those of you? Just fill the mayonnaise jars up and drink it. You go, oh, that's so unhealthy. In 2020, 73 people died from getting sick from milk. It was all pasteurized. Five people died that same year who were drinking raw milk. You got, wait a minute, we're dealing with a lesson on uh, milk? Alcohol is the biggie in this country. Everyone either socially drinks or drinks. One teaspoon of alcohol destroys 30 brain cells. Most of you sitting in this room can't afford to lose them. But we play all of our games about, we, we have to have our drink. We don't even know how to socialize without going. And then we don't understand that we need to become a, a drunk or a drunk. But what we're not understanding is after years of just playing your game with alcohol, men like me have to sit in a room and listen to what comes out of your mouth. And what comes out of your mouth is dealing with a brain that's been affected from the nonsense that you won't stop and go, maybe this is not good for me. And you notice how the room became dead silent? So I sit down and said, okay, God, we have an enemy playing games with us, and I get up and say things that in individuals just get all freaked out, but very few people in this room actually plan to get 50 pounds overweight. Very few people in this room plan to go bankrupt. Very few people in this room plan to get hooked on porno. And yet the polls tell us that 75% of the men in America mess with porno in some way, shape, or form, and 35% of women do. Very few individuals in this room planned to not go to school or not be in some kind of apprentice work. Most people never planned in this room to get a divorce or become an alcoholic. And very few people plan to just live a fake Christian life. What it comes from is making decisions. I put in your notes in the very beginning there, what kind of decisions you make, same thing I said last week, what kind of decisions you make determines what kind of life you're going to live. We make our decisions and then our decisions make us. And the problem in our culture is we have a whole bunch of people that have never learned how to make decisions. That's because we have a whole bunch of generations who committed themselves to working instead of raising their families. And we have generation after generation after generation that's never been taught coping skills, how to do the things they're supposed to, or as simple as how to cook. And some friends down in Florida in their church one time, one of the ladies thought it would be a really cool idea to have a cooking class. And so she announced in a church that's about our size, somewhere between three to 400 people, she announced they were going to do a cooking class. They set up a room in a kitchen. They thought about 20 women from the church was going to show up. They didn't think any guys were going to show up. They thought about 20 ladies would show up. And before it was all done and they got everyone in, there was a hundred and something individuals sitting in the room. She said, we're going to learn to do this recipe. When she said it, she said she noticed all over the room people had stuff out and they were writing and doing things just before we had the, you know, taking notes on the, your computer. She said they're all writing as fast as they could and she said, everyone in the room, the first thing we have to do is boil an egg. She said, you would have thought I dropped a science class on them. She said, I stopped and looked at the whole group and said, wait, 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 wait time out. Okay, what I'm hearing in the room right now, how many of you in this room know how to actually boil an egg? One lady raised, I'm not asking you. <laughs> Stay with the sermon. 
One lady in the room raised her hand. All the others just sat there looking at her, and she went, wait a minute. She said, I had to become so basic it was unreal. She said, I walked in one week and said, we're going to learn how to make chocolate chip cookies. And she said, everyone there got all excited. I started talking about a recipe, and they went, recipe? Don't you just peel the plastic and cut the slices off and throw them on the thing? <laughs> My mother one time, who was very sensitive, any of you had a mom who was very sensitive about her cooking? We had the Hispanic pastor in our church come over to eat with us. And he came over and he sat down and we were having chicken fried steak and mashed potatoes and gravy and, 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 and he was all impressed with the potatoes and he looks up at my mother and he said, these are the greatest instant potatoes I've ever had in my life. I was waiting for the explosion that was happening. My dad was trying to hold her back. As she began to explain to him, these were not instant potatoes. He had never had anything outside of an instant potato in his whole life. We have a generation that's not taught the next generation any skills about how to survive. I'm being honest with you. That's why the majority of our children in our society don't know anything about the Bible. They don't know anything about God's word. I tell stories from the pulpit. I have kids looking at me like, what are you talking about? I have high schoolers and college people looking at me like, what are you talking about? And I'm sorry, I have 30 and 40 year olds looking at me like, I've never heard that story before. But if I mention American Idol and I say someone's name, everyone knows what I'm talking about. We have not taught what we're supposed to teach in every spectrum that you want to deal with. So when I look at you and say, I want to preach a series on just how to make good decisions and, and, and do what we're supposed to do, there's people that don't know how to do that. So in your notes, it says, I am faced with blank, a situation. I have predetermined to blank, take this action. We talked about it last week. My decisions will not be based on what makes me feel good for the moment, but what is good for the rest of my life. So when my values are clear, again, last week, decisions are a whole lot easier. So it's me sitting down and saying, okay, you know what? Every time I've ever got into trouble in my life, it's been over a bad decision. And when I'm honest about that bad decision, it was because I wasn't ready. And every time I've gotten into temptation and gotten into trouble and regretted it, it was because I wasn't ready. And so I made a pre-decision. I would start looking at life based on when I'm faced with this situation, I predetermine I'm going to act like this. That became simply put life-changing in my world because I'm reactionary, knee-jerk. Something happens, I react. I took two verses to heart that I give you this morning. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 13. Be on guard. Stand firm in the faith, be courageous, underline be courageous because that is so much of an issue in our lives, it's not even funny. Fear governs so much of what we do. Be courageous, be strong. Matthew 26, 41, keep watch and pray so that you'll not give in to temptation. But please don't miss Keep watch, that means pay attention to what's going on around you so you don't give in to temptation. Because the Spirit's willing, if I sit and have a conversation with you, you're going to go, yeah, that's what I want to do. But the body is weak. These two verses are a powerful foundation, but it means keeping my eyes open. It means paying attention. It means listening to the people around me. We suck at that. It means saying to God, you've got me sitting in this room today for a reason. I'm here. So what are you saying to me, God, that I, I need to be prepared? I need to be ready. I need to be on guard. I need to watch and pray. Everyone that's married in here, say amen. amen. How many of you are married to the greatest person in the world? Amen. How many of the greatest person in the world is also a twit? Amen. Isn't marriage exciting? So me sitting down and saying, she's a woman, hello woman that I'm married to, wave, please, 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 that, that's the gorgeous creature I'm married to. Okay, me married to her, I'm a man, I am 100% man, I don't have a female part of me to get in contact with. She's 100% woman. How many of you have noticed that men and women are different? I don't give a flying flip what society says to you. We are different. 
And being different, I have to look at her and go, she doesn't think the way I think. She doesn't act the way I act. If there was a book written on how she would act, the book would be this thick. If there was a book written on how a man acts, the book would be this thick. (laughs) Women are running around all the time trying to figure out what's in our head. Can I tell you what's in a man's head? Nothing. Nothing. (laughs) I scratch my butt. (laughs) Who's looking? Hell, Jim. Whereas women are analyzing the living daylights out of everything. Okay, if we're going to be married with this, that means I have to sit down and say, okay, Father, you put her in my life for a reason, and praise God, you put me in her life for a reason. And since that's all there, what is God trying to do in her life, and what is God trying to do in my life? Decisions. I have decisions to make. Decision number one that I have to make, not in the notes, decision number one that I have to make in watching and praying, are my ears going to open up and am I going to listen? Am I going to pay attention to what's going on around me or am I going just to be a normal male and say, Pfft. Why I say be on guard, why I say stand firm in the faith, why I say be courageous, why I say be strong, why I say keep watch and pray is because we have an enemy and our enemy's goal is to destroy us. I am not going to spend this sermon telling you that we have an enemy. If you're a born again believer, you learned a long time ago there is a God and we have an enemy. He is a fallen angel. This is not the yin and yang. This is not black and white. This is not any of this nonsense. He is not God. He's not omnipresent. He's not omnipotent. He's not omniscient. He's none of those things. He is a piece of living trash. And he wants to destroy you. And half of his game is getting you to go, oh, I don't know if he really exists. Keep telling yourself that cupcake. And he's winning. So if we become a believer that says, Father, I accept what you said, that I have an enemy who's upset at me because we're your chosen and he's not, then if I'm going to live in that, watch and pray means, number one, in your notes, mark out the enemy's plan. I have to sit and say, this is what he's doing. And I love Paul when he says, I wrote to you as I did to test you and see if you would fully comply with my instructions. When you forgive this man, stop. Okay, we are now caught in a situation that this is one of those stories in the Bible that we don't have all the information to. What we do know this wise is there's an individual that offended the church, did something he wasn't supposed to. This is called church discipline. Oakwood's done it twice in their 26 years where an individual does something they're not supposed to and we do what the Bible says. An individual goes to them and says, you're not supposed to do this. They don't listen. We go get another individual. They don't listen. We go get a pastor. They don't listen. It comes before the whole church and we kick them out of the church. Most churches don't have the guts to do that today. We do it out of love, not out of hatred. Technical question. This body is dealing with a guy that did something he wasn't supposed to. He apparently did something to Paul because he's dealing with the issue of forgiveness. And he's saying to the body, you have to forgive this guy. Because if you don't forgive this guy, the problems are going to get worse. Have you ever noticed how easy it is to forgive a person when they do something to someone else? But when it's you... So apparently there's a bunch of offended people in this congregation. And Paul writes them a letter to say, I'm testing you. You've got this guy that did this. You're supposed to forgive him. Everyone in the congregation is like, amen, we're supposed to forgive him. But a few people are not being able to forgive because it involved them personally. But God said you're supposed to forgive. In our church one time, there was a lady and her boyfriend that had multiple kids, would not get married. We talked to him multiple times. They just said they weren't doing it. Went through a whole process. We finally said, you need to leave the church. This is improper. And so they finally left the church. Six months later, I'm standing looking at people walking in the door. And here she came walking in the door after she was told you're not allowed to come back to the church. She comes walking in the door, but she's walking in the door like this. Because she had a wedding ring on her finger. And that morning, she walked up to the front of the church and stood there and apologized to everybody in the congregation for the whole process of what had gone through and happened in that church and in that body. What was the job of everybody in the church? To forgive her, to love on her and care for her. There's not a one of you in this room that are perfect. I hate to break that to you. You're not perfect. 
And when we do things that offend each other, we're supposed to forgive each other. We're supposed to love on each other. We're supposed to care for each other. And we're supposed to look at each other and say, I forgive, I let go. I'm your brother or sister in Christ, and I'm going to love on you. Everyone who agrees, say amen. amen. Okay, the enemy doesn't like that. So when he's dealing with what Paul's dealing with, Paul says to them, and when I forgive whatever needs to be forgiven, I do so with Christ's authority for your benefit, so that Satan will not outsmart us. We are familiar with his evil schemes. I'm asking you, are we? Do we understand that everything that comes into our life that is rough or hard or difficult that God is using it to test us and Satan is using it to tempt us. He wants to destroy us. He wants to wipe us out. And yet God wants to take us and turn us into something that's profound and something's different. Does that make sense to everyone? So it's me sitting down as a believer and saying, God, I get it. I understand what you're doing. I understand what's happening. I understand how you're trying to work in my life. And I understand that you use really difficult situations in our lives to help us grow. But the enemy uses really difficult situations in our life to destroy us. God is trying to prepare us for something. Our enemy is trying to destroy us. When we get that in our head, the game that's going on, number two, I watch and pray my mission is to never assume. All of my life listening to people talk, I know you're strong, I know you have great abilities, but you're not as strong as you think you are. You have a responsibility, hear me, you have a responsibility to be honest. I am married, I have a responsibility to be what I am supposed to be to her. No matter how I'm feeling, no matter what I'm doing, and walking around saying I'm A-OK -okay and everything is fine, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12 says, if you think you're standing strong, be careful not to fall. Counselors have watched this forever. Pastors, professional counselors, people overestimate their ability to resist temptation. Resisting temptation takes tons of energy. And the part of your brain that helps you go no gets tired and gives in. And when we give in, all the guilt kicks in. Sorry, I use this, it's dumb. I know it's dumb. Do any of you in this room have the same problem I do with chocolate-covered Bavarian cream donuts? Do any of you, when you drive by Tim Hortons, have to say, I rebuke you, Satan! You see, some of you know. You're, you're like, you have an emotional conflict with donuts? Yeah, I do. I believe when you get to heaven, Jesus Christ is going to be standing there drinking a cup of coffee and eating a donut. Amen? Okay, now some of you like, it's not, it's not a Bavarian cream chocolate covered. Well, yeah, I know. You, you like those, you know, sugary, dry, sprinkled things. Or some of you like those strawberry filled things. I can take my whole sermon and stop because I've listened to people do this all my life. I had gastro bypass surgery to reach into my life to help change Frank to go from one size to another. Do you know how many individuals I heard say the words to me, why don't you just learn to push away from the table? I said things back to them like, won't you learn to shut your big mouth? I have a problem with opening my mouth for food. You have a problem with opening your mouth to let garbage out. You go, you're being rude. They weren't. See, I can, I can just stop and go, I'm sorry, that was my struggle in life. Some of you, your struggle is a bottle of alcohol. Can we all be honest with each other? Hi, my name's Pastor Radcliffe. Many of you have heard me preach for a long time. I've never had a beer. I've never put whiskey in my body. I've never smoked. I've never taken drugs. Do you know that I do not get done with church last night? I'll use last night because it was, it was late. It was dark. I was tired. I don't get done with church and I'm on my way down the road and there's not a part of me that goes, I think I need a beer to relax. The enemy doesn't attack me with that. Okay, the enemy's not going to come up to me after church today with some guy and go, yo, man, just got in from, you know, hey, got some really good stuff. I'm not going to go, oh, baby. <laughs> 
How many of you would guess I'm not going to do that? Not, it just, it's just not happening. I don't get done and go, well, I need a cigarette in the worst way. That's just, that's not me. But in your world, that might be where you struggle. This might be your dog fights, not my dog fight. Okay, that's what we have to understand. The enemy doesn't look at us and go, here's something that has never been your issue and we're going to attack you with it. He attacks you with something that is an issue that you've already been warring with. I came to the house the other day, I pulled into my driveway, I looked over and a woodchuck went running underneath the deck. How many of you know that woodchucks and dogs don't mix? Okay, so all of my dogs, all three, my dogs are big. They can't get under the deck. But we got this one strong-willed, strong-minded little fart named Clara that's a dachshund. She fits right under there. So Robin has to keep yelling at her to get out from under the deck because if the dachshund and the woodchuck meet each other, dachshund's, dachshund, badger dog, there's going to be a war. Okay, I don't want that war to take place. Everybody agree? Okay, so I come out and I see the woodchuck. Well, I didn't get to the woodchuck in time to, you know, pull out my handy-dandy Baptist gun and shoot. So it's under the deck. Now I have to trap it. Okay, but woodchucks aren't stupid. Okay, they're not just going to walk into a trap. They're Methodist. They don't go into tight places, okay? <laughs> Some of you that don't get that, tell the people who don't. Okay, anyway. So I've, I've, I know this. You know, I can look up woodchuck's favorite food. It's not filet mignon. Nope. It's not lettuce. No. No, they tend to like cantaloupe or squash. And so it's me going and buying the right stuff. It's also then me being smart. It's not taking the whole stupid thing and putting it in the cage to trap them. It's putting a little bit of it out on the ground so the woodchuck finds a little piece of it and sits there going, oh, knife, 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 yeah, bring more, 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 more. And then I put a little more and a little more and a little more and I keep moving it where? Over to the trap. And finally, there's a nice big display of it with, you know, porno woodchuck pictures in there. <laughs> and the woodchuck goes wobbling their little butt into the thing and snap. Isn't that where Frank wanted the woodchuck? Then isn't this how the enemy messes with you? He doesn't drop the whole load on you. He starts over here with just a little bit and he gives you a little bit, a little bit, a little bit, a little bit, a little bit till he gets you where he wants you. This is how the enemy plays his game. The faster I get that in my head, the better I'm going to do. It's me never assuming that I have the strength to be what I want to be. This is how I get victory over temptation. I love number one point on that. It's called move the lines. Move the lines. The Lord has placed the Jordan River as a barrier between our people and you people of Reuben and Gad. There was also a half tribe of Manasseh in there. Not talking about them right now. You have no claim to the Lord. So your descendants may prevent our descendants from worshiping the Lord. Historically, so you know what was going on, all the people of God were moving across the desert. They came to the Jordan River. They were all crossing it. But these tribes, Reuben, Gad, and a half tribe of Manasseh looked and said, we have all these animals. The ground over here on the west side of the Jordan is phenomenal. We're going to stay here. But they looked at everybody and they went through all this dispute. That's unimportant right now. They went through all of this dispute and in the middle of the dispute, they said, this is what's going to happen. We assume that where you're going to be, you're going to walk down a certain path and it could pull us away from God. We don't want that to ever happen. So the Jordan River is the line. We put space between you guys and us guys so you guys don't influence us. We use that same technique in our Christian lives. We put space between us and sin. It's an old technique, but it works. It's powerful. We pre-decide, I'm going to make a better choice. I'm going to live a better life. And this is the line right here. And I don't cross this line. Oh, I don't do something else. I don't walk up and dance by the line either. I don't play tippy-toe going across the line. How many of you in this room know how to swim? How many of you don't know how to swim? Okay, for those of you that don't know how to swim, is it logical that you stay away from swimming pools? Everyone who agrees, say amen. Okay, I learned how to swim. You know how I learned how to swim? Jumping off a diving board into a 10-foot thing, not knowing how to swim. I went all the way to the bottom. I'm sitting at the bottom of the thing. My father stepped out of the motel door and looked at over there and saw me in the water, and he saw me do something miraculous. I walked on water. 
uh, on the bottom of the pool, not at the top. <laughs> and I walked right over to the shallow end. And I got out and ran all the way around back, got on the thing and jumped again and walked out again. My dad suggested I might want to move my arms the next time. That's how I learned to swim. But before I learned to swim, I was wise enough to go, no get near the water. Thou could drown. Everyone in this room who says, that's really good wisdom. You can't swim, stay away from the pool. Because you have a 2.3% chance that your wife is going to push your sorry fanny into the water. Therefore, I stay away from the pool. I stay far away from the pool because I'm safe staying away from the pool. Issue. What issue is it that rains havoc in your life? I will go this far. I won't get any closer. If you have a problem with drinking, isn't it logical to you to stay away from bars? Um hmm. If you have an issue with overspending on Amazon, isn't it logical stay off the computer? Or maybe give a friend of yours your password so they can check and cancel orders and protect you? Isn't it logical? You're going to start dating and you go, okay, what, 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 what do I know I'm like? All men in this room that like women say amen? Mm, okay. So since I know that I have a propensity toward liking ladies and I start dating, isn't it just sheer logical? Okay, if I do this, it's going to lead to this, and if I do this, it's going to lead to that. So maybe I don't do this so it doesn't lead to that. Like, okay, no sniffing hair. How many of you agree Biden would have done a whole lot better if he would have learned that rule? Instead, we have demented pictures of... And everyone talks about it, and everyone puts out pictures about it. Wouldn't it have been logical if someone said, don't do it? No sniffy. And every time he went to go, snow and go. You just draw the line. I, snow, I know sniff hair. Because I know if I sniff hair, it's going to lead to coddling. And if I coddle, it's, uh, yeah, we're not doing that. Eating, I struggle with this. Maybe going to that restaurant's not good. Drinking, maybe going to that bar is not good. Maybe in my marriage, drawing a line and saying I'm not crossing that line is good. You go creating barriers, isn't that restrictive? No, it's freeing. The real issue between the people of Israel and the people of Reuben and Gad was the people of Israel that were concerned that the people of those two groups were going to lead them away from God. So they said, this is the Jordan. We don't go across it, so we don't have to deal with that. Learn to move the lines in your life. Number two, you want to have victory over temptation. Number two, maximize the cost. If I give in to temptation, what do I risk? What do I risk? I love Numbers 32, 23. But if you fail to keep your word, then you will have sinned against the Lord. That just changed it. If I fail to keep my word, I've lied to you. If I fail to keep my word, I promised you something and I, I didn't do it. So I have sinned against you. No, we raise it to the next level. I have not just sinned against you, I've sinned against God. And when I put it in the thing of God, what I'm doing is sinning against you. The Bible says, be sure your sins will find you out. We have lost that principle in our growing that me thinking I can do stuff in secret where no one knows it is forgetting that I have a Savior that sees everything that I do. So me taking any struggle that I live in to help myself, I ask myself this question, what is the worst that could happen? If I live a life without God's word, what could happen? If I've refused to pray, what could happen? What does walking into a certain sin in my life produce? I walked down the aisle just like a bunch of you did. I got married to a woman that I love with all of my heart, just like a bunch of you did. I made a proclamation that I would stay loyal to her for the rest of my life. She deserves that. Please hear what I just said. She deserves that. I am not a self-centered, egotistical male. 
I am a servant called to serve her. There's multiple ladies in this room that have met with me before. All the ladies that have met with me before, you've noticed that I don't ever meet with you in a place where no one is. If you're a lady in this room and you've, Pastor Frank, I need to meet with you. We always go to a restaurant, correct? 99.9% of the time, every lady I meet with, I meet with at Leo's. How many of you ladies have noticed that? I go to Leo's. Once a year, every year, I walk into Leo's. I look at all the waitresses and I go, hi, you're my backup. The new ones are always like, what? You're my backup. What do you mean I'm your backup? Um, how many of you know multiple stories of pastors that had affairs? The Jim Bakers, the Jimmy Swaggards, and all that bull crud in our society? I hear it again and again and again and again and again. Men and women who are in leadership don't know how to raise to a certain point in life because they were never given the skills by mommy and daddy. They don't know how to reach a certain point of individuals looking at them. I am a pastor in a church. I can't go anywhere. People don't know me. I walk into places all the time and, and there's a, hey, pastor, how's it going? I walk into places all the time. Ah, that's that jerk religious dude. I was walked in Walmart the other day. This guy saw my Satan Sucks shirt and just went off all bugged about my Satan Sucks shirt in front of everybody. He wasn't smart enough to know the more he mouthed, the more I got to answer back, the more I got to answer back, the more I got to preach. <laughs> Here's what I learned in life. You don't have to do anything. You just have to be accused. If someone accuses you, leader, of doing something you're not supposed to do, your life is destroyed. So I have to go overboard. I have to sit down and say, a lady wants to meet me. Sometimes, no, go talk to one of the other women in the church. Sometimes I meet with them, and when I meet with them, I go meet in a restaurant. I sit with waitresses, and I say, you're my backup. You're the one that makes sure that everything I'm doing is fine, and that if someone ever says, oh, Pastor Frank was with so-and-so, you're getting drug in to say, hi, this is my fellow neighborhood waitress here. She knows exactly what I was doing. You might think that's overkill. I call it living in the world of what's the worst that can happen. Because you know what I refuse to do? And she's heard me say it. I refuse to ever break her heart. I refuse to ever have to walk in and look at her and say, I'm sorry. I refuse to ever have to walk up to my children and look at them and say, I screwed up. I don't want to walk my best friend Ron and tell Ron I failed. And I don't want to ever stand in my pulpit with tears rolling down my face telling you I was wrong. Please forgive me. I would rather stand on this side of the line as far away as I can stand so I don't have to worry about it. Does that make sense to you guys? See, it works in your life too. It's me sitting down and saying, you know what, God? I got it. I, I, I understand what I'm supposed to be doing. I understand how I'm supposed to live this. And I understand sitting down and saying, I have to maximize this because I agree with what C.S. Lewis said. Integrity is doing the right thing even when no one is watching. When no one's standing there, I still do what I'm supposed to do. Oh, I also understand a third thing about it. I called it mapping out your escape. One of my favorite characters in the Bible is a guy named Joseph. I love Joseph in Scripture. Everything that could be done to Joseph was done to Joseph. Joseph, from a young man, knew that God was going to use him as a leader. God gave him dreams. God showed him some things about himself. And his dippy family turned on him. His dippy family became abusive. All kind of hurt, all kind of bitterness, all kinds of things that his family did to the final thing of a telling him, we don't love you, hate you. And then selling him into slavery. Being sold into slavery, the caravan brought him into Egypt. Standing on the block, a man named Potiphar walked up and bought him. Potiphar brought Joseph into his house. Potiphar found out real quick this Joseph wasn't a normal guy. This guy had phenomenal organizational skills, great leadership, and could run everything. And Potiphar just said, here, bud, it's yours. I'm going down to the gambling house and do what I want to do. I don't have to worry about anything. You've got it covered. 
There was one problem with Joseph. How many of you women in this room know what a hunk is? Joseph was a hunk. Good looking face, nice bod, gorgeous hair. Well, Potiphar had a wife that wasn't so bad herself. And our Bible says that she kept putting pressure on Joseph day after day after day. But he as a man refused to sleep with her. And he kept out of her way as much as possible. Um, can we stop just for a half a second there? I always love this thing that gets pictured of Joseph, that Joseph was a righteous man that understood I'm not supposed to do that. Okay, I don't have any problem with that, but you need to understand something. A man doesn't make plans to stay away from a woman that kind of looks like his boxer at home. Understand? If mama ain't so good looking, daddy doesn't have plans. If mama's hot, daddy got to make plans. And what Joseph was seeing was Potiphar's wife that was a babe. Don't you read into this that good old brother Joseph was just walking around, oh, that hussy won't leave me alone. No, he was saying, I'm not going into the house, I'm not doing this, I'm not doing that, because somewhere in his heart, there was a thing of going, oh my soul, she is, ooh. And she kept putting pressure. I, I, I love this, the, the wonderful line in here, kind of the same sign. Refuse to sleep with her, that means have sex. So one day, however, no one else was around when he went in to do his work. She came and grabbed him by his cloak, demanding, come and have sex with me. Joseph tore himself away. Ladies, wouldn't you love it if some little hussy at work went after your husband and his answer to it was not, oh, I'm sorry, ma'am, I don't do that. His answer was, ah, and, and ran. <laughs> and you got a phone call from people at work. Do you know what your husband did today? He ran down the hallway in the office screaming his lungs out because Mary Lou was trying to flirt with him. You as a woman would do two things. One, you'd walk up and kiss him and say, I'll take care of you tonight. And two, you'd go, and what is Mary Lou's office number? All ladies who agree, say amen. amen. Thank you. At Oakwood, people are not afraid of our men. They're scared senseless of our women, so don't ever forget that, okay? She grabbed him. Don't ever forget this. No one plans to mess up. But very few people plan not to. Most of us don't sit down and say, you know what, I need to lay a plan out. Joseph did. She comes and grabs me. I'm splitting. Joseph understood something that Scripture teaches that Paul shared with everyone in the future. Joseph pre-decided, she grabs, I run. The temptations in your life are no different from what others experience. And God is faithful. He will not allow the temptation to be more than you can stand. Please do not ever forget what this verse says. When you are tempted, he will show you a way out so that you can endure. He did not say it would be easy. He didn't say that this would just be something that would just kind of run in and run out. He said, you're going to have to set up things in your life that you say, this is the line, I don't cross it. I take things in my head and I grow them to say, this is the extreme. It could get this bad. I'm not doing this. And then that I plan a way to get out of this because it is better to have a good name than to have a good coat. Everyone agree? And so Joseph lost his coat. Oh, his coat got him accused. And I want you to never forget the next thing I'm going to say. Joseph got accused and put in a jail cell. Their jail cells were nothing like our jail cells today. Their jail cells were hell holes. So Joseph sitting in a jail cell, starving. Joseph sitting in a room that there was no place to go outside and go to the bathroom. He went to the bathroom in that room every single day. Couldn't have his clothes washed, couldn't take a bath, and lived in that hell hole. Don't you think that Joseph sitting in that mess got attacked with despondency, depression, and out of it 
because in his heart, he felt God had turned the lights off. And it didn't quit. Most of us think that when we beat temptation, we run away from it and everything becomes really great. When most of the time we beat temptation and it just stays a struggle. I want to teach you about the struggle. Because Joseph sitting in the jail cell spent two years, not two months, not two days, two years sitting in that mess going, God, why? I did everything to stay pure. Why? Before God took him and raised him out of the pit and put him before Pharaoh and he told him his dream and he went from being a man in a prison cell to number two in Egypt. Would you please understand this principle about God? God allows you to go through hell and if you quit and you stop and you get depressed and you get out of it and you start going, God, why? And, and, and I'm just going to quit following you. If you do that, you never get to see what he's preparing you for because if you're his child, he's walking you through what he's walking you through to test you, to get you ready for something that will blow your mind. But a bunch of us never get to where our mind gets blown because we quit back here. Because we don't understand that the enemy is using this test to tempt us, to destroy us. And so that's why he'll throw this in your face, drinking in your face, sex in your face, everything to get you to quit right here, to never hit here. Because if you go from here to here, God will do things in your life that are mind-boggling. Do you hear me? Do you hear that? The story was not put in scripture of Joseph doing what he did for you to blow it off because the story's even deeper. You see, Joseph stood before Pharaoh and told him, this is your dream. There's going to be this many years of drought and famine, but there's going to be all these years of great stuff before it happens. You need to get everything prepared for the years of drought that are coming. Pharaoh looked at Joseph and said, no one else could tell me my dream. There is no other man like you. God took a guy from prison and turned him into a, there is no one else like you. You become the guy that will organize it. You will answer to no one but me. You will be number two in Egypt. Put a robe on him, put a ring on his finger, and parade him around this city and have people bow to him. Most of you never get people bowing to you because you can't go through the hell that you have to do to get to the promise. Suck it up, cupcake. Say, I follow God who can do anything in my life if I let him. But I'm quitting before I get to the greatness. Quit quitting before you get to the greatness. Does that make sense? Oh, but it gets better. Because when the drought kicked in and people all over Egypt started starving, people outside of Egypt started starving, you know the story. Joseph stood there and every one of his brothers came and stood in front of him. And because he was years older, they didn't know who they were looking at. And we make a big deal out of that whole thing about his brothers that had to stand before their brother that they had sold into slavery and that they had tried to destroy. We make a really big deal out of that. There's even a bigger deal. Joseph didn't look at his brothers and say, starve you pieces of garbage for what you did to me. He looked at it as God used that hell in my life to put me here to save a nation. You want proof of it? Every person in Egypt started starving. And every person in Egypt had to come before Joseph and say, I have no food. Help me. They sold all their money. They sold him all their animals. 
and then they sold his, their bodies. Do you know what we miss in the story? Guess who had to stand in front of Joseph? Potiphar and his wife. Can you imagine being Joseph standing second in command on the throne and you look at the man that bought you as a slave and you see the woman that accused you, that put you in jail for years? What would you do? There is no recording of Joseph treating Potiphar like trash or looking at Potiphar's wife and going, I finally have got you where I want you. We have a Joseph that said, all the bad that happened to me, God used it to put me in a position to change my world. Would you agree with me we need Christians that are world changers? That means you have to learn to bow your head and endure prison or you will never get here. Endure it. And let him lift you up and turn you into something that's awesome. Father, we thank you so very much for bringing us here today. The enemy has a goal. That goal is to destroy us. The enemy is an animal. He looks at us as something that he wants broken. He attacks us as individuals. He attacks the world. It's all a game. Yesterday, Father, some nasty, foul piece of garbage nation fired missiles into Israel. Bring that nation to its knees, please, Lord. Wake up our political leaders here in America to realize that that whole situation is going on because of lousy leadership in the White House. Help us as a people and a nation to realize we have an enemy. It's not the people of Iran, God. They need Jesus. They need you. It's not Israel. They need you. It's not America. We need you. It's our enemy who is trying to destroy not just our nation, but us as individuals. Help us to wake up, draw lines, realize exactly how bad it can get, and then make a plan for escape. Please, Lord. Grow us as couples, grow us as a church, and grow our nation as a people. We love you, Lord, and we ask this in your name, Father. Amen. No height, no depth, no life a final breath. Could ever separate us from your love No failure, no mistake No loneliness or pain Could ever separate us from your love Could ever separate us from your love Cause on the other side Of everything I'm afraid of you are standing with your arms wide open, wide open, even in my deepest doubts and wonders. You are standing with your arms wide open, wide open. I'm healed, man, strong. I found where I belong Forever I'm alive now in your love Oh, and I'm changed, unchanged by your 
darkness If I tried my best to hide You know the farthest ocean You give the morning its light I can't run from your presence No, there's no place that far, remember? So I'll run to you, my Savior For the safety in your arms If I made my bed in darkness If I tried my best to hide Do you know the farthest ocean You give the morning its light I can't run from your presence yeah, There's no place that far So I'll run to you, my Savior For their safety in your eyes side of everything I'm afraid of. You are standing with your arms wide open, wide open. Even in my deepest doubts and wonders, you are standing with your arms wide open, wide open. On the other side of everything I'm afraid of. You are standing with your arms wide open, wide open, and even in my deepest doubts and wonders, you are standing with your arms wide open, wide open. Father God, we come before you today. We go to leave this room. We want to hear you and feel your presence like we do right now. We as a people gather, we as a people come before you in your name and pray for Israel. I don't care what anybody says, I know what you say. And you say that when we are your church, we stand with Israel. There is no argument, there is no opinion that matters other than the word of God and it says we are to stand with Israel because when you stand with Israel, God's word says you stand with God. So, make sure you're on the right side of the Bible, folks. Lord Jesus, we love you. We pray these things in your name, amen. Turn to your neighbor, tell him how much you love him. Go be the church, you are dismissed. On the other side of everything I'm afraid of. You are standing with your arms wide open, wide open, even in my deepest doubts and wonders, you are standing